evening, I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us online, and if you're in the Nashville, Tennessee area, come see us first Wednesday of each month at 6.30 right here in Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ. Be glad to have you, and thank you for being part of our live audience as well. Where our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39, I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Over the last 20 years there's been a sharp increase in the number of Christians who either accept or even approve of at least parts of the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. How should Christians respond? Tonight our guest will share some insights into that question. Rubel Shelley has written two books on the issue, Male and Female, God Created Them, and The Ink is Dry. Rubel has spent his adult life in Christ-centered ministry through preaching, teaching at the graduate and undergraduate levels, and writing. His commitment is to non-sectarian presentation of the gospel. He was educated at Harding School of Theology and Vanderbilt University, and is the author of several books, including I Just Want to Be a Christian, And I knew Jesus before he was a Christian. But tonight, our discussion centers on his latest two books that defend the historic and orthodox view of Judaism and Christianity on same-sex relationships. And you'll meet Dr. Rubel Shelley right after this. And I would encourage you, if any of you have loved ones, church members, who have Alzheimer's, they find joy in the moment. You obey the gospel when you follow the pattern of Jesus' own life and activity. It is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God. I do not believe in luck or coincidence. I believe in blessings. He filled part of this ache of abandonment inside in many, many positive ways. And he was also sexual with me. And I had no idea that that was sexual abuse. The strange and and unusual thing that I didn't realize is that there are so very few people of color actually serving as missionaries around the world. Through my five years on the streets, God was always there, or I wouldn't be sitting here tonight. I've done it many a times, cremate folks. I couldn't imagine feeling that for eternity. I'm sure it's going to be hotter than 1,650 degrees. I hear that there are some tricks you play with your arm. I tried softball one year. I would hit the ball, pull off my arm, drop it. Still attached to the bat, and it was just a lot more efficient. And then the coach would come over and pick it up, and there's this arm hanging off. Please welcome Dr. Rubel Shelley. Come on up. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Long time no see. Larry and I have known each other for a long time, so. We Don't go back to the secrets. 80s what? at Ashwood. Yep. And uh, yep. because of you is the reason I'm involved with church production. I propose that we have a video ministry at the Ashwood Church of Christ called Video Vision. Yep. And uh, the first year I worked for free. The second year I got a half pay. Second year we tried to get to work for third free. Year, <laughs> third year. I worked year. for free the whole time I was the there. Third year I got full time. Yeah. yeah. And then we spent so much money that Madison had to buy us out. We came up here. I'm, I'm glad we were able to prompt the beginning of that. So, so I appreciate, I appreciate what you've done and are doing. Well, you have been on many podcasts and uh, been interviewed by several people. And I know the question always begins with, why did you write the book? And I can't help but ask that as well. Why did you write the book? Sure. Well, we'll start with this one. This book is, I don't know, a little over 400 pages. Uh, I didn't want to write that book, never planned to write that book. It's no surprise for you to know that over the last 
25 years especially, um, the culture in the Western world has moved away from what has been the Jewish Christian Orthodox view of same-sex behaviors. And Larry used the term earlier, not only to accept, but to affirm. And in the last several years, that has come into churches. Uh, sure, liberal churches for a long time, but churches that we think of historically as uh, evangelical churches, conservative churches. And as it began to be more and more a, a close-to-home issue, um, I started restudying the issue to find out if I'd missed something. I don't write things because I think I'm smart and you need to know what I know. I write books because I'm trying to figure out things for myself. I think through issues by going into libraries, reading stuff that I have not read. I've read much more affirming literature towards same-sex relationships than I have views that would be more like my own. Um, have I missed something? And for, for 3,500 years, it, it would be strange if Jewish and Christian rabbis, evangelists, apostles uh, had, had missed the meaning of those scriptures in the Old Testament. But um, it's not impossible that, that we might be mistaken on X, Y, or Z. So I started studying it, number one, because I wanted to be sure of the view that I held, that it was not just the historic Orthodox view. I knew what that was. But is that correct? Does it hold up in light of anything that somebody has learned lately about Hebrew and Greek and history that we just didn't know and we'd misinterpreted it? Uh, the more I studied, the more convinced, convinced I became that that historic Orthodox view is in fact a biblical view. And then the second reason that I studied it, I have friends who are gay. I have had people come to me in churches where I have served wanting to know would I officiate their marriage to women the first time that ever happened. These are not wicked people who set out to thumb their nose at God. I'm convinced they're people who got bad information from unreliable sources which information affirmed some feelings that they had. And in this generation, especially in what we call the postmodern era, it's hard to date that. Let's, let's say 1980. That's a fairly uh, generic idea of when the postmodern age began. Since about 1980, feelings are dominant in the determination of truth. If I feel this way, it just has to be true. At least it has to be true for me. Well, that's not a biblical view of truth. The biblical view of truth is that truth is out there as it is spoken and revealed by God. And our responsibility is to search for and adapt our views to that truth that's external to us. The view of truth in this culture is truth is inside me. And your truth may be different from mine. It's deep inside you. So what each of us does is look inside her heart, his heart, to discover his or her authentic truth and live to that truth. Um, that's not Jewish. That's not Christian. Um, it's really rather illogical. So the big book was research done over about a two-year period. There are lots and lots of footnotes in that book because it's not true just because I've written it. And so I've tried to document everything very, very carefully about Hebrew, about Greek, about Greek history, Roman history, about the exegetical materials related to Leviticus or Romans or 1 Corinthians, other, other key texts. The second book is titled The Ink is Dry. Um, my wife was always my first proofreader and editor of everything I ever wrote. And this book was finished um, last July or August. Uh, Myra died August 13th of cancer after a second battle with cancer. She'd battled cancer about 25 years ago. Um, 
but a, what the oncologist called an aggressive sneaky one hit about three years before she died. And she worked with me through this book. She, she saw it in pre-publication form. The cover had not been done yet, and it had not been released, but, but she proofread everything. And she said, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you've written this book. I, I think it's important. I know the subject matter is, is, is hot and debated right now. I think this is going to help some people. Now write one for me and people like me. And I said, well, babe, what do you mean by that? She said, that book's awfully thick for me to think about reading it, and it's got a lot of footnotes. You might write one that's maybe a little thinner and has fewer footnotes. So the second one is actually Myra's book. Um, she, she, never, she didn't live to see that one. But it, it's only six chapters long. This one, I think, has, I don't know, 15, 18 chapters. I'm not sure. It still has some footnotes because, again... I don't think something's true because that's the conclusion I've reached. If I can document it, I'll offer it to you as true. So there are two books, and, and this is not just the Reader's Digest condensed version of the big book. This one is, is actually a, a serious reference book. Um, it, it's written for people who, who want to read the footnotes. The second book is, is use, it's set up really for use by classes. Uh, small groups that may want to study, or a family that's, that's dealing with the issue. The title of that book, The Ink is Dry, um, a lady and her husband came to me and said, could we talk to you? This is going on in our family. One of our children has said and thinks that the transgender route is the route our child needs to go, what do you think about that, Rubel? And my knee-jerk response is we were literally walking down a church aisle after a church service. I called her name and I said, the ink is dry on that subject. Um, what Scripture says is very clear. Uh, this is the orthodox position of both Judaism and Christianity for 3,500 years. I've spent a good deal of time recently trying to restudy the issue, and I'm more convinced than ever that the ink is dry, that what the Bible says is not ambiguous, what the Bible says is very clear-cut, and what the Bible says is true and obligatory on us. So longer answer to a shorter question maybe than you usually get, but there are two books after all, and one is fat and the other is skinny, and I thought you needed, <laughs> I, I thought you needed to know the difference. By the way, that there is a, a set of six videos uh, by the same title, The Ink is Dry, that in, in cooperation with College Press, they're the publisher of the books, and the Harpeth Hills Church, um, those videos are, if, if, if you're interested in them, if you want to use those videos, videos are probably 20, 25 minutes each. They're not just reading of the book. It's a discussion of the six chapters with a little bit of fresh material, uh, new material beyond what's in the book. And each video closes with uh, maybe a handful of discussion questions that if, if you have watch the video or you've done it with your family or a small group or Sunday school class, those discussion questions would let you go into a, a, a deeper dive for yourself. So uh, it, it, it's an attempt to put together a lot of information. And, and here is, I hope, the distinctive thing. I'm not the only conservative Bible student who still defends what I've called the historic orthodox Christian view. But some of the material that I have read that comes down where I do, I think is not written in good spirit. It, it's harsh. And it's, it's sort of in your face in a way that's not terribly kind. I think sometimes we Christians, when we're defending what we believe to be the truth about who Jesus is or about the resurrection or about a an important doctrine of our faith, sometimes we do it with a square jaw and a, and a tight fist. And 
even if what we're saying is true, it diminishes the ability of people to hear it. A person who's gay is not my enemy. Somebody who has transitioned or who is in gender transition process is not my enemy. That person is my neighbor in God's world. And God says, love your neighbors. That's the second commandment. And the golden rule says, treat that person the way you'd want to be treated if you were, as I believe they are, confused, misled, uh, working off bad information. And I do think people will hear good information better if it's presented to them lovingly. And the LGBTQ plus community is not the enemy them. They are people that God loves. And God has been in the rescue business ever since Eden. You read the Old Testament, you read the New Testament. We're not inventing new kinds of sin. It's all in the Bible. Um, murder is committed in the opening chapters when Cain kills Abel. Uh, the arrogance of human hubris at the Tower of Babel. Every imagination of their thoughts, only evil continually. Noah's generation. Move through the Old and We've only gotten through the first, what, six chapters of Genesis there. You move through the Old Testament, through the New. We haven't invented new ways to sin. And the whole theme of Scripture is the God who created us in His image loves us enough that He is not willing to abandon us to the mess we're in. And the whole story of Jesus is the story of rescue and redemption. And the same is true in our generation for uh, celebrate recovery for people who are dealing with alcohol and drug addiction, uh, for people who've gone through failed marriages, for people who are in the LGBTQ community. So, got another question, Larry? That was a long answer to a uh, short. Yeah. I've got a stack of questions here. Yeah, okay. And we want to leave time for people got to any ask yes, questions. No? So, yeah. so be ready. We might interrupt the yeah, interview. Got, yeah. True, false. Well, I do better. With, I sh I'm shorter answers with true, false. We might interrupt the interview to have some questions early on, so stand by with your microphones. Um, you have some questions in your book. You may not want to get to these, but I think they're a very interesting. And what counsel do you give parents who have children who are experiencing peer pressure from uh, school friends to experiment with same-sex relationships. What counsel do you give parents? Well, the first counsel I would give is it is happening. Um, I, I, I do seminars in churches around this material, and I typically title that seminar, Should We Be Talking About Sex at Church? And I begin the seminar by saying the title of this seminar is Should We Be Talking About Sex at Church? And the next line is to say, they're talking about it everywhere else. We better talk about it at church. Because what they're saying in those places represents the culture of time and place, not Scripture, not the heart of God, not the truth. So my counsel to parents, number one, is teach your children about their bodies. Uh, teach your children about um, healthy sexuality at age-appropriate times. Years ago, um, when our children were very young, and I don't know if we have them anymore or not, Myra would know, we, we bought a series of four books that were age-graded uh, to go through teen years to help children understand their bodies. In the first book, what to call your body parts. Um, and just, just working through the four uh, stages to come to a healthy view of sexuality. Um, if children are going to learn about their bodies, what to call their bodies, uh, about sex and sexuality, what sex is about, what sex is for, um, uh, a lot of the early instruction I got about that or information I got about it was in the gym locker room. Uh, at Middleton High School, and it wasn't really very good information. At the time, I knew it was information that uh, I really needed to be hearing because of the context and the way and the kind of laughing and the. And, uh, we need to do better than that, 
And so books, videos, whatever. These are not geared to children. These are written to adults, but, but information that, that you can have that would help you answer to your children. Um, <clears throat> the first thing, the counsel that I would give to parents is beyond educate them. Don't be shocked if you hear things come from them that you didn't teach them because you have such a minimal amount of time and you are the ones who give a minimal amount of information to your children about anything. Um, they're in Sunday school 45 minutes to an hour on Sunday. Uh, maybe they do youth group stuff. They're in public schools, multiple hours a day, five days a week. Public schools are, are not teaching Christian worldview. They still have locker room conversations where the conversations that I got some of my first information were being had, and the information's just as bad now as it was then, if not worse. Because back then, I don't know that the word transgender was in our conversations at Middleton. I, I mean, we couldn't spell it, but we, I don't think we talked about it. And the only way we talked about anything related to same-sex relationships was, was with denigrating terms that I don't use today of people who are gay. You don't denigrate people, and you don't denigrate your children if they come to you expressing an attitude or a point of view that you disagree with, that you know is not Christian, you say, sweetheart, where, where did you hear that? Um, I had a student in Michigan say, well, Dr. Shelley, what we're talking about now is where not people are prostituted to do homosexual acts or lesbian acts. We're talking about loving, mm. committed, consensual, deep, caring relationships between people who happen to be of the same sex. They just didn't, that was not an option. That, they didn't, in antiquity, no such set of relationships existed. They raped people at the ends of war, anal rape at the, at the end of wars. That, and by the way, the UN just did a white paper on some of that happening in Russia, Ukraine, in, in the war there. That's, that's been a way of feminizing, demeaning, humiliating, defeated soldiers from antiquity. Well, that's what the Bible is condemning. If, if, if they had had, in the days of the Old Testament, the days of Moses or Amos or Isaiah, and certainly the days of the New Testament, Jesus and Paul, if they'd had loving, committed, consensual, same-sex relationships... That's what the Bible is condemning. They wouldn't be saying what you're saying, that it's sinful. But they did. And my response to the person who said that was, well, my doctorate is in philosophy, and my major element of reading was done in Plato. Have you ever heard of a dialogue that Plato wrote called Symposium? No. Symposium is a dialogue of Plato where three same-sex couples, one of whom, Pausanias and Agathon, have been in a committed, public, open, consensual relationship for over 30 years. And in the conversation at the symposium, symposia were dinner events in Greek culture. A limited number of people would come together. They usually would have a good meal. They'd have some wine. And there'd be a topic for discussion in the evening. Uh, and the topic for discussion at that symposium was eros. Um, that, that's one of several Greek words that means love. It basically is a word that means passion. Uh, the drive to, that causes people to desire one another, um, ultimately, maybe romantically, sexually. And so the, the topic is Eros. And the three couples make speeches about Eros. 
And here's what they say. There, there are basically two kinds of arrows. One is ugly, tawdry. It's where maybe, and in Greek culture, there was a system of mentorship where older men in elite families, this didn't happen in slave families, older men who were lawyers, businessmen, politicians, elite families would place their sons, women were trained to do domestic chores, they place their sons with one of these established persons to be mentored into that profession. They didn't go to Vanderbilt, get a graduate degree, an MBA, and go into business. They, they were mentored to a man who's been successful in business or farming or medicine, whatever, and they would learn from. And that would begin at about age 13 and go until 18, maybe 20. And the relationship included sexual favors on the part of the older to the younger. And the younger male served the sexual... There are all kinds of paintings, plate paintings, vase paintings. There's all kinds of literature from antiquity. This was not shameful. What was shameful would be for an elite family in Greece not to have a son placed by the time he was... I mean, if he wasn't placed by the time he was 14, it, was, it, was, it just looked bad to the family. Their son's not going to get into some of the better echelons of, of Greek society. And so they are discussing Eros in the context of that culture. Sorry to have to give you so much history, but most people don't know a lot about Greek history. Um, they said, well, there are two kinds of love in those man-boy relationships. There are the tawdry, sorry, evil ones, where a man simply exploits the younger male. And he has sex with him. And he toys with him. And when he begins to grow a beard, when he becomes an adult, 18 or 20, he tosses him and gets another fresh boy. 13, 14. And, you know, he may do that two or three times. And then they said there is the divine form of Eros. The, 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 we might say in Christian language, the holy form of passion and Eros. And this is what had passed between Pausanias and Agathon. You take this person as your mentee. You're the adult mentor, mentee. They're Romanos or Romane. And you don't simply exploit and, and use for a few years and then get a fresh one. You, you do as we've done. You commit for life. And you care. And you nurture. The symposium is a beautiful piece of literature. Some Christian preachers read from the symposium in their wedding ceremonies. There's some beautiful passages on love. They don't realize. <laughs> okay. Um, if any of you have been doing that, you know, okay, you know better now. The symposium documents that in Athenian society in the 4th century B.C., it not only is known that there are both exploitative and committed, compassionate, consensual, covenanted relationships, but that one is looked at askance and the other is looked at as the ideal. Um, it, it, it is in Roman literature. Um, Cicero, a Roman senator, a Roman poet and writer, tells about tomorrow I am going to the wedding of the son of one of my best friends who is marrying a, a man. And he said he will place the stola, which is the marriage shawl, um, in their day, instead of lifting the veil as we might, they would put the shawl around the wife. And that was part of the formalizing of the marriage. He said he will place the stola on his male lover. And Cicero said, you know, this is becoming so common. I think before long, they're probably going to be registered in the Roman annals. 
marriages were not registered in Roman law the way we register them um, when you got married, unless you're even older than I am. Uh, you, you had to go to the county clerk or circuit clerk, wherever, you had to get a license. And then that had to be documented, and the preacher had to sign it and witness and turn it back in. Um, Roman marriages were documented in, in the archives only among the elite. And the elite would have been the imperial family, the emperor and his extended family, and the senators and, and the wealthiest of people. Cicero said, you know, the time's going to come. This is becoming so commonplace. Uh, we're going to be documenting male-to-male marriages just like we do historically male-to-female marriages. You say, well, what about female marriages? Um, Dr. Bruton has written a book. There's much less about female-lesbian relationships than male relationships. For what reason? Women um, occupied a much lesser position in both Greek and Roman society. And so um, women typically were not literate even. Uh, they learned household chores. Um, they, they didn't learn to read and write. They didn't do poetry and books and Plato. Um, so it, it, it shocked the student who came to me to say, I said, wh where did you get the information that everything the Bible would have been talking about was, was rape, pederasty, pedophilia, um, exploitative, abusive forms of same-sex relations. And you're expecting, he you said, I found it on the internet. No, uh, uh, even a less reliable source than this. He said, well, my professor said that in my freshman philosophy class. Um, a lot of what is said in middle school, high school, undergraduate, graduate days, uh, schools and college, in almost every discipline these days is set out of ideology rather than fact. Um, the biology department, for example, may have someone who argues that gender is a spectrum rather than that sex and gender are binary exclusively. Scientifically, gender is binary. You're male or you're female. Your body is male or female based on the reproductive apparatus internal to your body and the kind of gametes, reproductive cells, that your body produces. There has never been found a single case in Homo sapiens where a body produced both male and female gametes. Male gametes, the tiny gametes called sperm. Female gametes, the larger reproductive um, cell called egg. There has not yet been found one uh, body in species Homo sapiens that produced both. And what are sometimes called intersex bodies are those rare to be dealt with with great compassion and sensitivity. And I, I, I would hate to have to make some of the decisions that families have to make, where there are chromosomal abnormalities at birth that cause not, in this case, a, a club foot or um, a cleft palate or some sort of, we would historically have said, mental retardation, but that produce some sort of abnormality of genitalia. There's a much smaller percentage of those chromosomal abnormalities than there are, say, with cleft palate or cleft club feet. The National Institute of Health says it is 0.02%. It is two one-hundredths of one percent of live births that present that way. So that, that, that's, it's a very rare condition. It does not change the normative answer in science of how many sexes, genders are there. Um, but you will hear in a postmodern world, occasionally a biologist talk about the gender spectrum, male to female, and, and uh, the scale along. Sex and gender are still binary. In the postmodern world, sex may be allowed to be binary, male or female. By the way, if you apply for a passport, hmm. 
you no longer have M and F as your choice. You have M, F, and X. Um, I went for my annual checkup to my doctor's office um, four months ago, maybe. I had seven choices where it said, you know, sex. And the last one was other. And you could write in. Um, but in our culture, okay, even if sex is, is said scientifically to be binary, male or female. Yeah, but gender, gender is different from sex. Here's what the World Health Organization says about gender. Gender is subjectively determined by each person. In other words, um, I am male. I have X... Y chromosomes, every female in the room has two X chromosomes. So with my male XY chromosome, according to the forms that we fill out for government, doctor's offices, lots of other places, we can choose our gender identity. That's the current term. Um, in fact, on those forms, it may not even say sex, check the box M or F anymore, it is as likely and perhaps more likely, increasingly so, that you choose your gender identity. Um, and the gender identity, uh, a male can choose the female gender identity. It, 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 is, it is not Christians who are going to be the most effective ones to, to challenge that. It's going to be fathers and mothers of girls who are good athletes and two or three boys either as a lark or just because they can't make the football team decide, well, we're going to run track as females because male bodies, uh, once you hit puberty, they develop much faster, the bone structure, the muscular structure gives them advantages even among elite athletes. Um, you notice women, women don't play professional football. They just don't have the muscular and skeletal strength to compete against a 300-pound lineman or, or to down a 220-pound running back. Um, time out for a qualification here on that point. I think Christians have to be careful when, as I'm trying to do, give information that somebody doesn't hear me encouraging you or a critic of mine hear me saying. So you want to you lobby the legislature and, and you want to get those laws changed back. You want to challenge the courts that have said that same-sex marriage is now legitimate and marriage can't... Frankly, no. Um, the mission of the church is to herald the kingdom of God. It is not to lobby in the streets for red or blue talking points in election years. Uh, we, are, we are in a season, what, three months away from an election. I told people in a couple of sermons six months ago, there are going to be bullets to fly before we get through this election season. It's already started. There'll be more. And some of the people who are saying some of the most hateful things in this election year are preachers from pulpits. Uh, that, that God has foreordained and God has anointed and God wants and the God candidate and the anoint. God's not nearly so interested in this American election as Americans are because the kingdom of God doesn't depend on anything that happens in the United States of America. The church has thrived better in contexts where it was at the margin and being marginalized and even being persecuted than it has in the last few hundred years, three, four hundred years of what we call Christendom where Christianity became so watered down that it became sort of the, the cultural norm. And a lot of people believe they're Christians because they were born in America. I've had people tell me, yeah, I'm, yeah I was born in America. I'm a Christian. 
Well, a lot of people who are born in this country are, are Muslims or Buddhists or atheists. Being born in America doesn't make you a Christian. The mission of the church is to announce the kingdom of God. Don't, don't get caught up in thinking, well, if, if this same-sex marriage, what, we, we've got to fight that in the streets. No. We have to teach the gospel because same-sex marriage was legitimate when the Old Testament and the New Testament were written. And God did not call them to boycott the Herodians or to challenge the Caesars. The Lord called them to be an alternate community to the world. To be light bearers where there was all of this darkness. One of the ways we bear light into a fallen world, a dark world, is we don't lead with a square jaw and a clenched fist. The early church turned the world upside down, not because it went into the streets with a message of fight, fight, fight for Christian morality and, and the Jesus doctrine. The early church turned the world upside down because they fed hungry people. They took babies that were being left to be exposed because they had a cleft palate or a club foot uh, or because they were girls. Um, abortion was legal. Infanticide was legal. And infanticide was just the exposure of children. They would sometimes literally leave newborns at the dump. Christians at dawn would troll the dumps in the streets, and if there were abandoned children, they'd pick them up. Um, they, they went into prisons. You see, compassion and mercy were vices in the Roman system. Ever thought about that? What is Rome known for? The heel of the boot. Rome, all roads lead to Rome now. From Rome, all roads went out so they could move the troops quickly. And so they could conquer and subdue and keep under their control. Christianity did not go out to fight the Romans and to overturn the Roman Senate and the Roman laws. Christians created alternative communities called churches. And those churches were political. Christianity is political. Political in the sense that it had an impact on culture and how culture runs, but not by war and the heel of the boot. What Christianity didn't get into, though it was political, and the classic, classically the word political means concerned with the common good, concerned with the, the general welfare of people. Jesus said to me, he said, I was in prison, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked. You came or you didn't. I mean, that, that's, that's political in the classic sense. You're concerned about the common good. When we use the word politics, that's not what most of us mean. We mean partisan politics. We mean red or blue. Folks, our, the flag behind which we march is neither the Christian flag that, that some churches have on their podiums. Um, I, I, I don't want to preach in a church sanctuary auditorium that has an American flag. We don't march behind the American flag. We march behind the cross. And the message of the cross is not the message of nationalism, my country, right or wrong. And it's not the message of, of red or blue. Uh, th there is a psalm that describes the ideal leader of the people of God. It's probably the prayer that David prayed over Solomon when he knew the the kingdom was being passed to his son. This week, only this week, I went through that psalm. It's Psalm 72, if you want to read it when you get home. And, and I, I color-coded Psalm 72, red and blue. And, and some parts of it sound very red. 
Uh, they, they talk about prosperity. Um, they, they, they talk about, in our life, good markets and good returns on your investment and, and, and field flourishing. Some sound very blue. The weakest among us, the hungry and the poor. Um, some of it sounds very red. Righteousness. There's a law and order theme in it. Other parts of it have to do with reproducing the holiness of God in human character. We are so red and blue in our culture that to talk about, oh, law and order and justice and courts, well, that's red language. And to talk about uh, and, and the economy. And, and on the blue side, to talk about taking care of the poor, educating children, feeding the hungry. That's blue. Christianity is not red or blue. Christianity is this total message because the early church covered all those bases and then they had one other thing that the red and blue culture in our country right now doesn't have. Civility. Or to use the distinctively Christian word, love. And if somebody's particular passion was, let's say, the law, he, he's an attorney or a judge, we need him. But this is a social worker taking care of abused children and protecting their rights or even being concerned about immigrants and the poor. Are you, are you red or blue? I'm Christian. I want this and I want this and I don't want to have to fight you and say, I'm for one, but I'll give up the other for the same. No. The, the church is... Ecclesia. Ecclesia is a political word. The word ecclesia, and it's used in Acts 19 in its common way. It's, it's the assembly of a town citizens. The church is the assembly of the citizens of the kingdom of God. And we pledge allegiance to a flag with a reservation. We have to obey God rather than men. And our priority will always be the cross. It won't be, it won't be my country right or wrong. And it won't be me hating you if you're red, you're blue, you're blue, you're red, you're... Christianity's not in the hate business. And, and the notion that Christian pulpits are being used and partisan politics have become such that the cross is painted, painted in colors of red, white, and blue, gets caught up in what we call the culture wars. The culture wars are over, church. We lost. Okay? In terms of the courts and the laws, same-sex marriage, a lot of things that I believe, you would believe, are wrong, they're legal. And some of them are even subsidized. We lost the culture wars, but I'm not sure our goal ever should have been to win the culture wars. You can't impose Christianity through law. You woo people to Jesus Christ through truth and love. When Jesus came, according to the prologue of John, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus it is, it is this balance. And, and they're mentioned in the order I gave them. Grace and truth came through Jesus. But let's keep on the subject of sexuality for a minute. When a woman was taken in the very act of adultery, what's the first thing Jesus showed? Grace or truth? Grace. He said, you guys are not fooling me about what's going on. You're not concerned about her. And you're not even concerned about the Torah. She's caught in the very act. 
She, well, where's the he? Okay, all that. Torah says, if you bear testimony as a malicious witness, you're just trying to hurt somebody. If you're discovered to be a malicious witness, whatever penalty your testimony would have brought on that person falls on your head. Ouch. Um, so when Jesus says, now the one among you who's without sin, he didn't say, now if there's anybody in the room who's perfect, he said, if you aren't being malicious witnesses, and that's a reference, the story is in John 8, and the reference is back to Deuteronomy 19. It talks about a malicious witness. You set somebody up, and you were party before, during, or after the fact. You knew what was going on here, and you didn't stop it. If you're a malicious witness, and you're found out to be a malicious witness, the court is going to slam you with the penalty your testimony would have brought. You follow? The, the guy's wanting to stone her would have been stoned. So when Jesus says, okay, let the one of you who's without sin cast the first stone, he's not saying if any of you is perfect. He said, if you're not malicious witnesses, go ahead and stone her and I'll, I'll you know, we'll all just have to join in. Interestingly, if you hadn't read the text lately, they dropped their stones, their rocks. They had, the oldest dropped theirs first. They knew they'd been had before the young bucks realized it. So they all sort of discreetly, quietly say, you know, I think it's dinner time at my house. So they leave. Grace has been shown. Jesus is alone with a woman. Still going to show grace. So he says, next time be more careful. Don't let them. Nah. That's not grace. Grace showed mercy to her and gave her a moment's rescue and the chance to get out of this situation alive so she could repent. Now is the time for truth. Dear lady, you, you, you got a break today. You're not going to die. Don't sin like this again. We've lost the culture wars, but grace and truth are still ours to dispense in the world. We can be kind to alcoholics and addicts. Celebrate Recovery is a wonderful ministry that churches should have, host, where, start to say where needed, where isn't it needed these days. Uh, just, just make, you know, AA, make space available for AA or NA or SA or what, for people who are trying to recover. Grace. And, and be patient. People are going to fall off. To, just, to, to justify my presence here. And for, <laughs> to justify my presence. Larry, let, are, let, you, are you still here? Let me at least throw it open. To are you cup. still Yeah, I'm trying to be here. I'm sorry, I forgot Larry was here. Let me see um, if there's a couple of questions that your uh, comments have prompted. Larry knows me. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for being here tonight. Uh, what would you say, what, what does it look like for the church to show Christ-like love and relate to the LGBTQ community. Yeah. Or what's the difference between affirmation and welcoming? Yeah, a, a number of us use the language, and maybe it's not the best language, it didn't originate certainly with me. Stan, uh, Stan Grins, I think, is one of the first persons I heard using it. He's a Baptist ethicist. He talks about being welcoming but not affirming. That's how I am with an alcoholic. I worked a lot with alcoholics over the years. When I taught for a few years at Vanderbilt Medical, Medical School, I worked with the addiction unit. And we, we brought back 12-step programs of all sorts to the, at the time, Ashwood, Woodmont Hills Church. We had 41 12-step groups meeting in our building every week, 41. We were welcoming. Not one of those 41 groups affirmed <laughs> uh, addiction or alcoholism. Uh, one of the elders and I, Roy Hamley, decided we would try to do that. This was the 80s. The Americans and French were arguing what to call it. 
we settled on AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. I knew some people who were HIV infected. Um, Roy and I decided that we were going to announce a support group for people who had AIDS or who were HIV infected or for their family members. We had to divide it into two groups. Um, but one group was people who had the disease, the other was family and support persons to them because the, the issues overlap, but they weren't the same. Um, if, if churches will be honest enough about alcohol or drugs or sexual issues to say, we know the, we know the cultural view of this is very different from the Christian view. Of it. We cannot support and do not affirm the cultural position we have a class, or we have instructional materials, or we have support groups for people who are dealing with. I, I don't know the best way, and nobody has come up really with a really good model for how to help people dealing with these, and, and they're different, LGBTQ, and, and there are a number of others, lesbian, gay, intersex, transgender, whatever. Um, I recently joined the board of a group of people who are trying to figure out the best way to equip churches to minister to people dealing with these. Uh, Leonard Allen and I are, are both on that board. We're the only two on that, I don't know, 15-member board or so out of Churches of Christ. But, but we're trying to figure out what's the best way to be welcoming, to tell people, if you come into our presence, we're not here to shame you. We're not here to say, you're going to hell, get out of here. We don't want you on our property and, you know, shame on you. Um, it is to say, we are a group of sinners in recovery. Our sin may not be the same as yours. My sin may be the arrogant pride that says, I don't do that. I've never been tempted by that. Um, I just think, yuck, when I think of that, I can't imagine no, that's wrong. Arrogance is as wrong as homosexual behaviors. Self-righteousness is as ugly and drives people away as alcohol addiction. So the shorter answer is to say we must come up with strategies of some sort as we learned 50 years ago we weren't doing this with alcohol. AA had to teach us how. Um, AA would... If, if you're... You don't have to be sober to come to AA. You have to want to be sober, and we'll help you with strict accountability and support. Oh, that sounds like what church ought to be. We'll show you grace. We'll tell you about redemptive love. You, you can be part of this community, but we're not going to affirm your addiction, uh, your philandering, uh, your greed, your what. You can be in recovery with us, and the specific things you need to deal with information, whatever, about same-sex issues or just sexual issues. Um, you're welcome here, but understand we're Christian, and our welcoming is not an aff affirmation. It is a welcome invitation to come to let Christ do His work in you. you, you the, the message of hope in 1 Corinthians what 6, 9 to 11, Paul says, look, um, liars and thieves and murderers and what and, and people doing same-sex behaviors. He said, that's what you were. But you were washed and justified and sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Corinth was a wide open seaport town. There was no sin you could name that wasn't in Corinth, uh, either volunteer or for sale. Paul said, church, that's where, that's where you were. Peter says, 1 Peter 4, your friends think it's strange that you don't run with them to the same excess of riot you used to now that you know Christ. Churches in the first century were made up of people who were welcomed but not affirmed to learn of the grace of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the agent of transformation, but the church is the community within which the Holy Spirit deigns to work. The church is the temple of the Spirit of God. Here we go. Pause you for one more question and one more quick answer. 
Got one more over here. A, a local congregation of the church in our area 25 years ago had a member who decided to have sexual uh, gender reassignment surgery. Went from female to male surgically and hormonally. And they were already members of the congregation, or that person was, and the family couldn't interfere with it. Nobody wanted to interfere. You know, I think our minister at the time said, if we interfere, they'll go to another country. It won't be safe. We just can't do that. So it went ahead and they had all that done. Then that person came back as a male and married a female and was a member of that congregation. So then traditional roles, even though they're not really I mean, we, traditionally we have men serving the Lord's Supper. We know that's traditional. So that person began to be given jobs to do that mostly our male members did and uh, was accepted and then got divorced. And I think maybe the divorce was a speed bump for him progressing. <laughs> but so is that affirming or is that grace to, to put that person into traditional roles with our congregation or that congregation with a gender reassignment surgery and hormones? That's a complicated question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I do not think that is grace in action. I think that's closing down the obligation that we have to truth. Um, very complex situation. New York Times recently carried an article interviewing probably a dozen or more people who had gone through gender reassignment one way or the other. About half of them, maybe 60% of the people in it, now detransitioning. -tran Transitioning and detransitioning are, are processes that in this culture the countries where that started, um, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the UK, the, they have essentially called a halt to it because of the long-term harm to the individuals who go through the process. This gets so complicated in our neighborhoods. I have a neighbor whose daughter is actually a male and had reassignment surgery yeah. to become a lesbian. Yeah. And I, li I got lost, but I mean, that's the way it is. Yeah, I, I have... His children have three mothers. Yeah, I, I have a friend, I have a friend who is in that process too, um, from male to female. Um, I want to maintain a relationship I cannot affirm it. Um, a, a theology of the body is more complex than I have time to go to with my timekeeper over here. But um, <laughs> the, the, human, the human body, by, by analogy, let, let's take salt. What's the chemical formula for salt? NaCl, sodium chloride. It's salt only when they are together. If you separate the two, both these are toxic substances. Humans are differentiated unities of body and spirit. And we're human beings only when body and spirit are together. When they're separated, we're dead. You are what your body says you are. As a human being, it, when body and spirit are unified to begin to be formed from conception forward, the genetic issue is settled. Um, now, the complexity of people who've already gone through that and, and maybe then come to Christ or as Christians repent. How do you undo? I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know. Um, I, I would want to be loving and gentle and patient and help them try to work it out, but I don't know. I mean, w w you ever hear the joke about the player coach in the minor leagues that the left fielder had made three errors by the second inning that had allowed the other team to be ahead by four runs. Player manager, you could do, used to do that in minor leagues. Starting the fourth inning, he slams, he, he takes the glove off the left fielder's hand, throws it in the floor and says, on the bench, I'm going out and play left field in the fourth inning. He goes out in the first batter up, 
hits a long fly ball to left field. He misjudges his, and he comes in at the end of the inning, throws his glove down, says, you got left field so messed up, can't nobody play it now. <laughs> uh, as, as one sinner trying to tell somebody how to unravel complex thread and get knots out of it. Uh, humility is the order of the day. Patience, kindness. I don't, I don't know how to get the knots out of all that thread. The, this, the, this is the key text, I think. Uh, not proof text, but I think coming late in the New Testament. This is a summary text of what we're supposed to preach, teach, practice. It's Hebrews 13, 4. The second book is built around this text. Marriage should be honored by all. Well, in the Bible, marriage is always a male, a female, and covenant. You, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. Sexuality, sexual expression, we're all sexual beings. Sexual expression, sexual intercourse, belongs only within the context of marriage, not through pornography and, and premarital sex and extramarital infidelities. Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. That's the positive view of sexuality in the Bible. It belongs where it was placed in Eden. And the negative is Hebrews 13, 4, as it continues, because... God will judge the adulterer, the person who breaks covenant promises about marriage, and all the sexually immoral. And the word translated sexually immoral there is the Greek word porneia. Porneia embraces any sexual activity outside male-female commitment within marriage, whether it's opposite sex, same sex, premarital, extramarital, um, a marriage ceremony has been set over it. it or, so the, the, the biblical thesis is strong and clear, unequivocal. Uh, there, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are confusing because, well, it seems like in this situation, women did some things that maybe over here they're not allowed. To, we need to we try to figure that out, and we don't come to agreement on it. With regard to sexual behavior, there's never fluctuation. There's only one message. Sexuality is designed for the marital union. The marital bed is holy before God, but any sort of promise breaking or sex outside of that context, that's porneia, it's immoral, it's outside God's will. The, the, the biblical message is clear. The complexities we create in a culture that does not honor that and that not only has made legal but has many TV sitcoms, the hero is somebody who is transgender. The hero is the gay couple. The hero is the gay person. It, it, there's an agenda in the culture, not just to say, hey, get used to it. The agenda in the culture is sign on to it or history is passing you by. Um, I'm going to get two questions in, then we're going to shut it down. Yep. Last Larry's one. Just trying to Last shut it down. In your book. One of the questions is, I didn't choose to be born homosexual any more than you choose to be born heterosexual. If God made me this way, how can it be sinful for me not to live this way? Yeah. Your answer? Yeah, I, I don't want to deny that in a fallen world, we are broken all the way down to our genetics. Do I believe some people are born with a disposition toward same-sex attraction as opposed to opposite-sex attraction? I do. Just like I know people who, by birth and nature, dis disposition, they've got really bad tempers. I know with regard to alcohol, there are genetic factors in play such that if you are a male offspring of a male alcoholic, you are 40% more likely to be an alcoholic by virtue of genetic predisposition if you ever take a drink. I, I don't see any reason to deny, as some people feel compelled to, that there are genetic predispositions to our sexual desires. Some people genetically, uh, by virtue of predisposition, seem to have no interest whatever in sex. Um, and, you know, marriage, date, oh yeah, I, I don't I have no interest in, well, 
by the way, we need to give the message to people in churches and kids in our homes. You don't have to get married. Um, if you choose to be single, God bless you. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 said there are advantages to the single life. You can devote some things to the service of God being single that family distracts you from. Single life is not bad. Married life is good. Kingdom life is good, married or single. So if, if I am born this way, God doesn't decide how each of us is made. I, I, I don't use that language. If we are born with certain predispositions to any number of things, we're not morally responsible for that. We are morally responsible for how we deal with whatever that predisposition is. An inclination for me to be sexually inappropriate across sexual lines. Any male in this room who says he has never been tempted sexually would lie about other things too. Okay? The, the issue is not can you be tempted or could you be attracted to? The question is, when it happens, what do you do? Temptation is not sin. It's the activity that's sinful. The person with the bad temper, predisposition to it, hair trigger, doesn't sin by having a hair trigger temper. But will sin if by the Spirit of God and whatever help he needs to get, he doesn't keep that temper from making him be violent in his home or abusive to his children, or a jerk at church. The same thing true with a person who predispositionally is prone to alcoholism. The issue is not that I'm, I really, really want to drink. The question is, what do I do when I want to drink? And the question with regard to people who, and I, I see no reason to argue with them and say, I, 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 I had a a fellow student at Fried Hardeman. I've got friends of mine. We started college together to, back in 1963 at Fried Hardeman. In my sophomore year there, there were three of us, four of us together in a devo on the porch of Paul Gray Hall. And one of them trusted us enough to say, you know, we've talked about some things, guys, that different ones of us struggle with. He said, something must be wrong with me. I'm not interested in girls. And he wasn't trying to hit on one of the three of us. He said, but... I've got a friend back home who's male that I, I know that's wrong. Would you pray for me? I think we helped him. Number one, we didn't beat him up and tell him you, you can't feel that way. I, I can't tell him how he feels. We did pray. It, it, he finished school. He served as a minister in churches of Christ for 25 years. He married had three children. Uh, that the issue is not to tell somebody, no, you don't feel that way. The issue is to help them not act on certain feelings they have that they know, you know, Scripture says, are outside the will of God. Temptation isn't sin. Your feelings or your attraction isn't evil. But if you do not deal with them by the power of the Spirit, self-restraint is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, self-restraint. Restraint with the power of the Spirit. All of us have stuff that we are inclined to do under certain circumstances. And we only sin if we give in to it. Thank you, Ribble. I want to close by reading the uh, concluding words in your book, The Ink is Dry. The human life is essentially a choice between doing things my way versus doing them God's way, a theme that runs through the entire Bible. What David, Jesus, and Paul taught in ancient times is still true today. May God give us ears willing to hear and hearts eager to obey. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for all your research in these two books. I encourage you to buy a book. They're available on Amazon.com. Take time this week to share your story of amazing grace with someone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for being part of our live audience. Thank you, everyone.